Yeah, it's your boy Chili here. Welcome back to Reflective Serialization. We've done a lot on the serialization part of that, but uh, not a lot on the reflection. We're going to fix that today. We're going to do some reflection. But first, you might notice when we, when we have this, um, this movement with a bunch of waypoints, it can take a long time for it to finish and get to the end of the waypoints, which can be annoying. So I'm thinking it would be nice if we could control the speed of the sprite. We can give them a different speed. And I mean, that shouldn't be too difficult to set up. Let's, uh, let's give it a shot. So in the move command here, let's give her a little float speed. And then, so now we have a single value followed by a variable length list of coordinates. So first we got to capture the single value. So this regex will capture a single value and then peel off the remainder of the string. Now we're going to say, hey, if we match this part, then we want to come in here and uh, create the move command. Let's just move this up here. And we're going to set the speed of the move command equal to stoff because this regex should only match things that can convert to a float. That should be fine, right? And then we got to set the arg string. And then we have our new pattern. This is the pattern for the pair. And then we do the pair matching in a loop. If we fail this match here, we can give the same error message. You could probably clean this up so there's only one, but I don't care. Just did a quick build to make sure I didn't do anything super dumb. And it did tell me, hey, you should probably initialize this. That's a good idea. Let's just do like a 0f in there. Now on the other side, we got to use this speed. So in here, we want to initialize the sprite not only with its initial position, but also its speed. So what is... Because I don't think this constructor takes in a speed, right? So we'll allow it to take in a speed default to 1f. Well, we actually, we already have a speed down here, which is nice. So we should default this to 2 to match that. And then we just say that our speed like this is equal to the speed that came in. And then in here, we can just do cmd.speed. So let's double the speed. We'll give her a 4 speed. Doesn't look like it's working very well. I mean, it could be worse, could have crashed the whole program, but uh, still, not impressed. What did I do wrong? Well, of course, you know, as you do, you update your command to put the thing in, and then you update your logic to use the thing that you put in. But what you're often going to forget to do is update your serialization function. Yeah, because now it no longer just has waypoints, it also has s dot speed. So it's a lot simpler to update the serialize but you still have to do something and if you don't do the thing if you forget if you add a member and you forget to add it into here the compiler's not going to tell you it can't it can't tell you when you're missing one here that's in the structure it can tell you the opposite if you reference one here that you erased from the structure it'll get right on your ass but this way no it's just going to silently fail and compile and maybe build nicely, go out into production, into the wild, and just cause you a whole bunch of problems. So, first, let's make sure that this works. So let me get my froggy boy started. He's moving now. That's good. Now we're making him a little zippy friend. Whoa. He's zipping. He's going zippity zoo -za. There you go. Ah, oh, a little freaky. He's freaking out a little bit here. Why is he freaking out? Well, this isn't... This is actually not a problem with serialization. This is just a problem with our our physics, our quote-unquote physics. So in the move sprite to coroutine, the, the termination condition is we keep we terminate when the length to the target is less than 1. So as long as it's greater than or equal to 1, we keep moving towards the target. Now the problem is if you move really fast, you can be like 2 away, and then you move towards the target, but you overshoot it, so now you're 6 away. And then you overshoot it again, and you overshoot, and you go blah, 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 which is what we were seeing. So what we really need to do is compare not to the, um, don't just use a fixed value, but make it scale by the speed of the sprite. Because the faster the sprite, the more it has the ability of overshooting. And so the more we have to kind of give it some leeway, if that makes any sense. So let me see if there is a function. We want sprite.get, ah, we do have get speed. So that already is in there, and that is going to fix it for us. So I just, I just sent a speedy boy zipping on his merry way. And he is not going to get stuck anymore because we have fixed the logic. But you know the reason why I insisted on adding this little enhancement here. It's to show you that it's so easy to add something in here and add all the logic and it all compiles well. 
but you forgot this one little boy in here and everything can blow up in your face. Now, wouldn't it be nice if you could like somehow loop over all the members in the structure and just say, yeah, call archive on each of those members. The information is there in the compiler somewhere, obviously. The compiler knows how many members are in the structure, what their names are, what their types are. If only we could somehow loop over that, you know, at runtime or at even better at compile time. But unfortunately, we can't have nice things. C++ still does not have reflection. Now, there's another reflection proposal in the works. You know, it says C++ 26, but you know, I, just, I don't know about that one. I don't know about that one, boys. I don't think we're getting this one, you know, within this decade when we see it in an actual compiler that we can use. But uh, here it is. It looks very nice. I wish we had it. I wish we had it. It uses the caret operator here, apparently. And you can access the member of a struct by its index in the struct, its number. You could also, you know, get how many members are in the structure. And then with that two pieces of um, information, you could loop over all the members and you know you could get their data types and you could get their names and whatever else you wanted and with that information you could write code that automatically archives all the members of a struct without you having to go in here and change it every time you, the way the struct is laid it out is changed so we don't have that well, what do we have well we have crazy template metaprogramming bullshit so this is the crazy bullshit there's a little there's a single header library nice to use and look what it can do for us. It can get us the name of a type. We can get the name of a member by index of that member in the structure. We can get the reference to the member by index. We can use this size of to get how many members are in the structure. We can do all sorts of crazy stuff. And it's even got a nice little for each thing that lets you loop, do a compile time loop over, you know, like all the members in a structure, for example. So it's, this is crazy. It uses crazy hacks. It even says so itself. It uses hacks and workarounds. Um, specifically, I think it uses structured binding. So you can do a structured binding of a structure into like a tuple, and then you can access the elements of that tuple. Now you need to know how many members are in the structure. So what you could do with um, Esfine or however you pronounce that, is you could just try Okay, I'll try structure bind with one member. Okay, how about two? Okay, how about three? Okay, how about four? Okay, how about five? Okay, how about six? Until like 64 or 128 or however many. So it's very hacky and nasty. But it can let us do some very sexy stuff. So let's play around with it. Now this one, this bad boy, as far as I can tell, he ain't in VC package. It's just a single header. We'll just copy that in. So conveniently, we got this little folder here for third-party libraries, and we're just going to copy over into there, reflect.hpp. Very nice. Then if we refresh the Solution Explorer, we see it in here. Let's, let's include that in the project. We got reflect.hpp. Where do we want to use it? We want to use it with net. So let's go include dot dot slash dot dot slash third slash reflect.hpp. So we'll get reflect in here. Well, let's put it, let's put it in here. I don't really care. So we got reflect for each. And this thing is going to take a function that is going to be called with a very specific signature. Uh, we'll use reference binding and then const auto i. So for each, you pass it a function, reflect for each, and then you pass it a structure to iterate over. And it will iterate over all the members of that structure. So this function will be called with the integer sequence going from 0 to n minus 1, where n is the number of members in the structure. And then for each member in the structure, what do we want to do? Well, we want to call archive on that member. How do we get the member? Reflect get member i. But we need to give it the structure s to get the member from. And so there you go. That's it. And this will generate basically just a list of archive for each member. So there'll be archive s.speed and then archive s.waypoints. And then whenever we add a new member or whenever we remove a new member or change a member's name or whatever, it's automatically done in here. You don't have to touch the serialization at all. Now when we build this, it does generate a few warnings for us, probably from our you know static analysis that we got in there. And we can wrap this away again as we usually do for third-party stuff, but uh, let's just run it, see if it works. 
So we'll give a nice speedy boy in here. And he is zooming. So that works fine. It's perfect. It's beautiful. If you just copy pasta this for all your different boys, they're all going to work the same. Now it seems a little silly to copy pasta this all in here. So we could do we could do a little better. So let's create an implementation template that works with any type T. So we'll do type name T. We should do class T, I guess. I don't know, it doesn't matter. And then it takes in T. S is the structure. And then reflect for each, blah, blah, blah. So this is our serialized implementation here. You can even put it in an anonymous namespace, why not? And then what we're going to do, we're going to define a little macro here. And this macro is going to define a serial templated serialized function that just calls into our implementation. And the parameter of the macro is the name of the class type that you want to enable serialization for. And then you can just do like this, just list all the types that you want to enable for, and Bob's your uncle. You can even clean up your namespace by undefining that after you're done here. And now every time you have a new type that you want to serialize for, you just add it to the list in here. So it makes adding and removing your own structure types a snap. And if you make any changes to those structures, they're going to be picked up automatically by this reflection. No programmer intervention required there. Very nice. Well, IntelliSense seems to have calmed its tits. So that's all good. There you go. Pretty dang good. This is very nice. This is going to catch a lot of problems for you. And the thing about this is, okay, let's say you implement a new type, but you forget to put it in here. At least that won't build. At least it'll tell you you're missing serialization function for this type, which is different than the story of you add a member to an existing type and you forget to put it in here because that will build just fine and blow you up. This one, at least you won't get caught with your pants down. The compiler will tell you. It's still annoying to have to type in serialize for every type that you want to support, but this is pretty damn good. Now, what if I told you we could also get rid of this, but it will require some delving into the dark arts of template metaprogramming. Are you interested? If so, stay tuned to the next video, and we are going to step up our reflection one layer up, and so now it will work with any type without you having to manually register it. It'll just work. Until then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot, and I will see you again with some more reflective serialization.